it started in a very um, organic way. Uh, my background was originally in uh, technology and then in finance, uh, but about actually almost exactly 20 years ago, I was an analyst at a hedge fund in Boston and I had just gotten married. I was a year out of business school and my family was visiting me from New Orleans, which is where I was born and raised. And uh, we're originally Bengali, but I was born and raised in New Orleans. And it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin Nadia was having trouble in math. So I offered to tutor her. She goes back to New Orleans. And uh, slowly but surely, she gets caught up with her class. She even becomes ahead of her class. I, I remember I called up her school. Uh, most schools don't appreciate these types of calls. And I said, I really think Nadia Rahman should be able to retake that placement exam from last year. And strangely enough, they let her. And the same Nadia, who was struggling with math only a few months before, then became an advanced student. So I was hooked. I started tutoring her younger brothers. Word spreads in my family that free tutoring is happening. And so before I know it, I'm tutoring 10, 15 cousins, family, friends. And I quickly see a common pattern. The reason why my cousins were struggling in math wasn't because they weren't bright. It wasn't because they didn't have great teachers or didn't go to great schools. It was because in a traditional academic system, you're moved ahead at a fixed pace. And even if you don't learn the material well, even if you get an 80% or a 70% on, say, uh, basic exponents, the whole class will move on to a more advanced topic, say negative exponents or logarithms, somehow expecting you to understand the more advanced thing without having understood the more basic thing. And, and the value of tutoring, what I was able to provide my cousins, is that we could review those gaps and fill in those gaps, uh, or even things that they might have forgotten. And that when you fill in those gaps, then, and you have a strong foundation, everything else becomes a lot more straightforward. And middle class, or actually I say, especially affluent families, educated families have known this for hundreds of years, for millennia, uh, that the school system is going to move lockstep and you need oftentimes to provide extra support for students so that they don't fall behind. Now, you know, I, I had a background in technology and even when I started tutoring 15 cousins, I had a day job, I was still working as an investment analyst. I said, well, you know, may maybe I could use technology to help scale these sessions. And so I, I started creating exercises, practice exercises for my cousins to fill in their gaps, to get some practice there. That was the first Khan Academy. Um, I didn't, I had dreams that maybe it would turn into something big, but I said, you know what, this is a family project. I'll just call it Khan Academy. The domain name was available and my cousins were getting a lot of benefit out of that. Uh, about a year later, two years later, 2006, I was at a dinner party showing this software um, that I had written to the host. I'm a very fun dinner party guest. And, and uh, while, while I was doing that, the host suggested, well, how are you scaling up your lessons? And I said, well, I'm hard. It's hard to scale up my lessons and, uh, with 15 cousins. And he said, well, why don't you record them as YouTube videos and upload them for your family? And I initially said, that's a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano, not for serious mathematics. Uh, but I gave it a shot. And uh, I asked my, I started making lessons on a lot of the things that I found I was repeating from my cousins on a lot of the things that um, I, I knew that, you know, they would, might have questions about. I was doing a lot of worked examples. And after about a month of that, my cousins somewhat infamously told me that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. Now, it's clear, important to, to think about what they were saying. They weren't saying that they didn't appreciate me in their life as their as a family member, as a cousin, as a tutor, to motivate them to dig deeper. But what they were saying is, if it's 11 p.m. and you're trying to do your homework, it's really nice to have an on-demand version of your tutor there that can pause, that can repeat. You don't have to feel embarrassed because you can just watch a video. No one has to know. You don't feel like you're wasting your cousin's time. So I took that as positive feedback. I kept making videos. It started becoming clear and working on the software. And it soon became clear that people who are not my cousins um, were watching. And they started sending letters from all over the world about how it was helping them, how it was hel helping them get through their class, how it was helping their children. So I was hooked. I kept doing this as a, on, a, on the side. By 2008, 2009, there were about 100,000 folks who were using this every month. That's when I set up Khan Academy as a not-for-profit. Once again, it's somewhat ironic. I live out here in Silicon Valley now. We moved from Boston to the Bay Area. It just felt that it was the right thing to do to not make this a business, so to speak, uh, that it should be a social good, hopefully fundable with philanthropy or government or, or other or corporate sponsors. And um, that's where we set up Khan Academy, or I did at the time. I was It was just me. Actually, I was in this closet at the time. Uh, and it was a bit of a grand statement, free world-class education for anyone anywhere. But the reason why I felt that was possible, and I didn't think this was going to be by ourselves, obviously the global public education system 
should have the same mission statement, free world-class education for anyone anywhere. But it felt like you can, you know, the free anyone anywhere part, the access would be even more possible with technologies like the internet, with devices becoming more available, uh, with, um, uh, 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 with, with on-demand video and software. And then world-class to me is always, you know, I always say that Aristotle was Alexander the Great's personal tutor. That's what world class has always looked like. It's just we had to make a compromise a few hundred years ago when we had public education. We couldn't afford to give everyone a personal tutor. Idea was, well, maybe we can get more world class if we can start to personalize with videos and exercises. And as I'll talk about in a few seconds, artificial intelligence, which wasn't on my radar back then. But, uh, you know, that first year, whenever you quit your job to do anything entrepreneurial, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, you almost have to start with the delusional optimism. It was a hard first year. I could go into details on that. But by the end of the year, uh, yeah, it went from nothing to almost something. Uh, folks like Ann and John Doerr, Ann is still our chairperson. They gave some of the first significant philanthropic donations to get off the ground. Uh, and then it just came out of the woodwork that Bill Gates was using Khan Academy with his own children. And I, you know, I, I say that because a lot of times efforts that are there for everyone, especially kids of need, kids who don't have it, what we tend to do is like, oh, well, we're not going to be able to give them the best, but maybe we can create a cheap approximation. But what's exciting about the time that we're living in now is that the same thing that Bill Gates's children used, they're now grown now and in college, we can now give to every child on the planet. Uh, but that obviously helped us, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation, Google became some of our first significant funders. And so we were we were off to the races as a real organization. Now Khan Academy is much more than me. We're over 300 people around the world. We have thousands of volunteers. We're in 50 plus languages. India is one of our, our, our most focused markets for, for, for many reasons. We think there's a lot of need there. Obviously, some of us are connected to the region uh, and, 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 and see so much potential there if only we can support them. And we realize that the best way to do this is in partnership with the, with the school system. So we started, so, you know, that journey from 2008, 2009, we had that funding. You fast forward to now or maybe a few years ago, and Khan Academy had grown from 100,000 users a month to now we're, you know, in the tens of millions per month and 160 million users around the world. As I mentioned, 50 plus languages, the team is much more than me. And we've just continued to do what I was saying, was cover more subjects and grades. People know us in math and we're very comprehensive in math from pre-K through calculus and statistics and beyond, uh, but also add the sciences, humanities, and many languages, et cetera, uh, many of these regional efforts that, that I've talked about. Uh, and, and we've just constantly been trying to make the personalization better. Now you fast forward to two summers ago, and we've had 50 efficacy studies. This is an important point that if students, even before artificial intelligence, if students are able to put 30 to 60 minutes per week into Khan Academy, about 18 hours per year, that those students are accelerating their math outcomes by 40% in many cases. In different efficacy, we had 50 plus efficacy studies, some so 40, 50, 60, some so 30%, but it's a pretty profound acceleration. So you now fast forward to about two years ago. Two years ago, I get a uh, email from Sam Altman and Greg Brockman at OpenAI. They were acquaintances. I'd met them in several different situations out here in Silicon Valley, but I didn't know them well, but I had a lot of respect for what they did. And they said, look, we're about to finish training our next generation model. It's the model that would have ended up becoming GPT-4. Um, we knew that GPT-3 already existed. And they told me that they thought that this was going to be the model that really opened people's eyes to what AI could do. And remember the context. This was four or five, six months before chat GPT came out. And even ChatGPT was not based on GPT-4, it was based on GPT-3.5. So I was skeptical, but I had respect for what they did. And when they showed me what GPT-4 could do, immediately a lot of uh, issues were there. It wasn't, it made math errors, it would hallucinate, worried about safety uh, with students. But it felt that if you could mitigate those risks, you could actually use this technology to get that much closer to a personal tutor for every student and actually a teaching assistant for every teacher. Help a teacher do things like lesson plans, progress reports, grading papers, things that teachers have to spend hours a week doing, uh, but, but it doesn't face, face the student. And so that's when we started working on Conmigo, uh, which is the AI 
tutor and teaching assistant on Khan Academy to support that work. You know, the learning is happening on the, the pre-AI Khan Academy, but now Khan Migo can nudge students forward, can answer questions if the videos, the articles, the hints uh, aren't enough. And we're trying to work on it so every day it's becoming more and more engaging and more helpful. And obviously it can help teachers with reports and, and things like that. And it's not going to fix everything overnight. I don't want to give anyone the impression that AI is a panacea. But I do want to double click on when ChatGPT first came out in November of 2022, immediately people, first of all, I was a little bit bummed because we were under a non-disclosure agreement with OpenAI. We were going to launch Conmigo on the same day as GPT-4, which was going to be March of 2023. And all of a sudden, this chat GPT thing comes out. I slack the OpenAI guys. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> you guys launched something. And they said, we didn't launch anything. We just put a chat interface in front of our old model, in front of GPT-3.5, and the whole world exploded. And I was bummed because chat GPT was a very superficial chat interface. It wasn't designed for education. It didn't have any education guardrails. It was clear it could be used as a cheating tool. It was clear that it could have hallucinations and all these other factual problems. It was, wasn't good at math. And you immediately saw globally education systems started to ban AI for good reason. They were afraid that it would be a cheating tool, etc. So I was really afraid that this was going to be the end of AI and education. But luckily, by March of 2023, educators around the world started to realize, look, AI is going to be a part of students' future. And if only someone were to build AI tools that support the student, support the teacher, and put appropriate guardrails around that don't cheat and actually can undermine other forms of cheating, then that could actually be really powerful. And that's when we launched Conmigo. And frankly, we were bracing ourselves when we launched Conmigo. We thought that people might not be ready for it, but we've had an unusually positive reception for it. And it, it, you know, some of the guardrails we put is that teachers and administrators can see what students are doing. The AI won't cheat. We have things like a writing coach that even if a student tries to use another AI, our AI will let, let the teacher know that, hey, I don't know where this essay came from. Uh, they didn't work on it with me. Uh, so we actually believe that all technology throughout human history is neither positive nor negative. It's neutral. It just amplifies human intent. Fire can burn you, it can destroy, but fire can create, fire can renew, fire can cook, can, can give you heat, can keep you alive. A knife can kill, a knife can be used to build things. Similarly, AI. AI can amplify negative intent, and there are going to be negative people using it to amplify their negative intent, doing deep fakes, cheating, um, misinformation. But I tell everyone, it's very fashionable these days to at dinner parties to debate about AI, whether it's going to be utopian or dystopian. And I tell everyone, look, this is not a flip of a coin. This is up to us. We know the bad actors are going to amplify their bad intent with AI. So the question is, how much are the good actors, hopefully all of us, willing to invest on the positive side? If the good actors amplify their positive intent and put more resources behind AI and things like education and healthcare and productivity in good ways, then AI is actually going to be a net positive for humanity. On the other hand, if the good actors kind of say, well, I don't know about this AI thing, I'm just going to go do something else, then you've just seeded this very powerful technology that's getting better every day at an accelerating rate to only the bad actors. And I think that's the most likely scenario that we get to a dystopian scenario. And I tell this to the Khan Academy team, and I know there's some educators in the audience here as well. I actually think education is the ultimate uh, app for artificial intelligence. One, there's a need. We, we will be seeing economic dislocation because of artificial intelligence. There will be shifts. There will have to be new skills that people develop, although I still believe some of the old skills are very, very relevant. And so what could be a better and more poetic use of AI than using AI to improve human intelligence, human HI, or H human purpose? And so if we do that, then you know we're, gonna, we're going to have a, a pretty exciting world to live in. And so with that, uh, thank you. To stay informed about the startup ecosystem, subscribe to my startup TV.